So uh, it is my pleasure today to uh, introduce to you uh, Professor William Scott from uh, Indiana University, University of Purdue. Uh, William Scott uh, contacted me uh, a couple of months ago and uh, suggested some assistance to our Ukrainians, to, uh, to, to Ukrainian scientists. And I offered him to give some lectures for our students at our university. And of course, for Inamin scientists who are also, who can, could, could also attend. And uh, I, I'm very happy that uh, at least for now, everything works and we are here. So a few words about uh, Professor Scott. He received his uh, PhD from University of California in 1972. Then he had several postdocs uh, in Rockefeller University and California Institute of Technology. And in 1974, he joined LA Lilly. Uh, he worked there for more than 20 years uh, as a research scientist in drug discovery. And then uh, in 2001, he moved uh, to, uh, university, to Purdue University, where he is a research professor at the moment. And uh, he is uh, uh, building his experience through a project which is called Distributed Drug Discovery, D3, which we, he will give a lecture at, uh, at the end of uh, this, uh, of his uh, se lecture series. So uh, it is my very great pleasure to uh, give a word to uh, Bill Scott and uh, to give him the stage for his lecture. Please, Bill. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Grigorenko. Uh, I regard this as a, a real privilege to be able to speak to you today. I just wish that I could be there in person. Obviously, that's a problem because of the, the war going on. Uh, I have a, a, a connection to Ukraine that someday I'd like to pursue further. My grandfather emigrated from Kyiv uh, at around 1900. And then also I, uh, my previous wife who passed away 20 years ago, grew up in Lublin, Poland. And uh, I still stay in contact with her family. I go back there periodically to visit. And a couple of times when I've been on the train from Warsaw to Lublin, uh, I've been in a train that's an international train that is on its way to Kiev, and I've just had the thought that someday I'm going to stay on that train and not get off in Lublin or get on in Lublin after visiting my previous wife's parents, and then go to Kiev and maybe find a little history of my grandfather and also be able to meet all of you in person someday. So with that uh, just introduction, uh, I'm going to start talking about the drug discovery process. And let me share a screen here. Get a pointer up here. Just add permanent visible arrow. Okay, very good. So um, I'm going to talk to you today about the drug discovery at a fairly high level uh, because I, I assume a lot of you don't have a, a, an intimate knowledge of how drugs are being discovered. And I think there are a lot of interesting stories here that will give you a perspective on how you can approach drug discovery, how organic chemists can approach drug discovery and, and biologists also. So I'll begin uh, the uh, seminar today by just showing you uh, an example of a recently discovered drug, recently meaning that it was just approved this past December. So it's not even a year that it's been on the market. It's the drug uh, is called, the overall drug is called Paxlovid, but actually Paxlovid is a mixture of two different drugs. The active ingredient in Paxlovid is this molecule here, called nirmatrelvir. And the way nirmatrelvir works is by uh, inhibiting a, a very key enzyme in the SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus replication pathway. That enzyme is called main protease or MPRO for short. By inhibiting that enzyme, you uh, have a cut off a critical pathway for the virus and it results in it not being able to replicate. Uh, I'll talk about later perhaps in more detail in the final seminar, in the third seminar on distributed drug discovery about how this molecule works and how it was discovered. But I just wanted to start out by saying, you know, 
drug discovery is really important. And the, things like this have made a big difference in people's lives, and we all know that. So I'm going to give you first a very short story of the drug discovery process, where we identify a disease that we're, we're going to want to treat. And one of the very first things that we do in that process of drug discovery is try to understand underlying biochemistry, biology involved in the disease process. Uh, with that understanding, we can sometimes develop a good screen that uh, allows us to, under, uh, to test molecules that could potentially uh, interrupt the, the disease progress. Uh, with that screen in place, and these screens can be very simple or they can be at a whole animal level. Uh, at the simple level, it gives us an opportunity to think about molecules interacting in a three-dimensional way and give us a more precise understanding of the interactions. When we're looking at a whole animal, you've got all sorts of other things to take into account. And so it's much more difficult to look at a structure and predict activity when you're just looking at screens at a whole animal. In any case, regardless of the screen you have, we need to come up with molecules to test. Traditionally, those molecules come, have come from either nature or from synthesis. Uh, in either case, we get the molecules we may have had some pre-selection process to help us figure out which molecules to actually make. But oftentimes it's, it's really kind of a random discovery process, especially from nature, where we, we have a lot of potential molecules that are isolated from natural products. And it isn't until we go through the screen that we get any insight in how these molecules actually work. In any case, we get the molecules from either of these pathways, we screen them, and then inevitably, uh, the first screen doesn't give you the drug molecule. You try to learn from the results. You look at the structures of the molecules that turned out to be show potential in that screen and try to come to understanding of what parts of that molecular structure uh, were important for the biological activity or the enzymatic activity, and then uh, make new molecules that would build on that understanding. Eventually, you're going to have to take into account other things besides just in these screens because we're going to take these into humans eventually, and it's a much more complicated system, uh, which we'll, I'll talk about later. So we, we do the screening. Eventually, we end up with what we will, uh, just in a very easy way, just call the best molecule. Uh, but we'll talk about what, how you figure out what the best molecules, again, in a bit down the line here. Scale up production of that molecule and deliver it to the patient. That is the very, very short story of the drug discovery process. I do that just so we keep in mind some of the essential pieces at the same time that we realize that it's a very complicated process. So here I look at that process from the disease to treating a patient as an improved drug. And we understand that the screen is just the beginning of this process. We have screens that are either receptor-based, enzyme-based, tissue-based, or in vivo or phenotypic. Phenotypic meaning that you're, you're not looking at some particular mechanism, but you're examining the whole organism and seeing how it's responding to that drug. Uh, but once we've gotten through this process, we've gotten our molecules from, from folklore, nature, archives, computational analysis, all sorts of different areas and, and tested them. And we get a hit. To go on further from that hit, we need to have some confirmation of both the activity and the structure of that molecule, determine if it's amenable, if it's something that you can easily uh, systematically modify. And we call this process structure activity relationship or SAR work. Eventually we get to even better molecules based on their interaction with some of the, in these screens. And then we begin a much more systematic SAR. But this is something that I, I just wanna point out here is going to be a really important area that goes beyond a lot of the simplistic thinking that we might have in drug discovery. Even if we have something that's very active against an enzyme or receptor very active in one of these cell-based screens or tissue-based screens, we've got to worry ultimately when we give this to a person, is it going to be absorbed? How, once it's absorbed, where does it go in the body? Does it get to the place that it needs to go to where that particular disease is, is uh, operating? It's going to be metabolized. How quickly does that happen? Uh, is that metabolism going to work in your favor or against you? Sometimes actually the molecule is metabolized to make an active structure. Uh, it's eventually going to be excreted. Uh, that whole process, if it's too fast, you won't have a drug. We have to look at all the side effects, the toxicology, all that is abbreviated as ADMET, absorption, distribution, metabolism, excretion, 
toxicology, then when we worry about making that molecule on a large scale, and sometimes molecules that have gotten all the way through this process have not, have not proceeded further because of production issues. At some point then you've gone through all this, you have a clinical candidate, you've got a good uh, data set telling you about the animal pharmacology and toxicology. You're confident enough that, you, that this molecule is not gonna kill people uh, at, when first given to them. You submit an application called an investigational, investigational new drug application. If that's approved, then you can begin clinical trials. There are three phases, typically of clinical trials. In the first phase, you just evaluate safety to make sure this stuff is, is not gonna harm the person that it's being given to. Establish the dose, maximum dose before you see uh, harmful effects. Phase two, you start looking at if that drug actually has an effect against the disease that you're targeting. It's in a small population. You take the drug up to higher and higher uh, amounts until you see an effect. And then with that data in, set, in place, you go to phase three to look at a large population of people and get the statistics that are important to tell you whether or not this thing actually does work and that it's not toxic. So that's the long story of the drug discovery process. I uh, sometimes, I think I'm, I'm mentally challenged. And I, I just need to have a very simple model to be able to think about things. And so even today, I still, like to think about the, the discovery process in, in, in uh, trying to find a drug to treat a disease in the way that was really used very early on in drug discovery, mainly thinking about a lock and a key. The lock would be, in, in our analogy here, uh, usually a receptor or an enzyme, which has some kind of complementary service that you can think of like a lock, uh, uh, the various uh, receptacles on a lock that are going to uh, be um, keyed up by that particular key. And then we can think of the molecule as a three-dimensional key that's going to fit into that lock. And if we have the right three-dimensional interaction that fits in and the receptor is affected in terms of its activity as an antagonist or an agonist at the receptor level, or if it's an enzyme, most of the time we're looking to inhibit these enzymes. So that interaction will displace or prevent a natural substrate from binding to that enzyme and you'll have a drug. So that's the analogy I'm going to carry through for the rest of the presentation today, thinking about locks and keys uh, and, and the molecules that we're making as being the keys that are gonna interact with some protein surface receptor enzyme lock. I'm just showing you here, these things still to me are very hard to look at. So I have to look very closely to be able to see what's going on here, but I just show a picture that was published in, uh, in December when the, the uh, uh, Paxlova was approved and near Matrelvar is the active ingredient. And this is a picture in science that was showing the uh, crystal structure of near Matrelvar, which I try to help you see in this enzyme by uh, at least coloring parts of the structure. So you can see here, for example, this five member ring here with uh, cyclopropyl ring attached to it with two methyl groups off of it, you can see it here. And that, that's interacting with various parts of the enzyme. The critical piece though, is this nitrile group. That nitrile group was actually over here. And this is kind of somewhat of a unique mechanism. There's a cysteine in the enzyme. Cysteine has a sulfhydryl group, an SH group, which is a very reactive group. And that cysteine group attacks the nitrile here in Paxlovid after you get all the the nice uh, lock binding attributes of uh, near Matrelvir, it brings in a nitrile group that interacts with the cysteine and it forms a, a reversible covalent bond with that nitrile, it makes it a very tight binding inhibitor. So this is one example of one way that one can go in design. Uh, I won't talk a lot about it, but if you can get an X-ray structure of the enzyme or the receptor, you can start docking molecules into that structure to see, to help you design the best molecules. This is a very complicated business too, because molecules are flexible. Enzymes and receptors are really flexible. When you get an X-ray structure of something, you get it frozen in time. And that may not tell you all the different conformations that the enzyme or receptor can get into. That could be potential different variations on the lock that are going to be 
uh, picked by a particular key. So let me begin by talking about some classic examples of drug discovery. And the way I organize this uh, seminar is to think about uh, a progression from certain classes of molecules that are small coming from natural products or synthesized small molecules up through moderately sized, well, to an organic chemist, actually huge, but to a biologist, moderately sized molecules like peptides, uh, an example being insulins. And then finally, I'll talk briefly about proteins, antibodies, which have become a very important class of drugs in the last, oh, I would say 15, 20 years. So let's begin with the natural products. Uh, this is just a classic story of discovery uh, of, of penicillin. Here's just uh, the mold, penicillin, penicillium notatum, which is growing on a Petri dish and is kind of a colorful mold. The thing is, what wasn't understood at the time of the discovery of uh, penicillin was that this mold was producing amongst all the other molecules that are part of its metabolic pathway, a molecule which we will now call penicillin, which turned out to be a, a rare, very powerful antibiotic. Well, how was that penicillin discovered? Nowadays, uh, we still do, like in our undergraduates in the lab, we'll do this Kirby Bauer disc diffusion assay, but it's also used when people are trying to look at what particular antibody, antibiotic you should take for a particular uh, antibiotic, uh, uh, microbial bacterial infection. So what you can do is you can take a, a simple plastic or, or glass dish with agar in it, which is a great growth media for bacteria. You can then put on uh, these little uh, discs. Uh, they're often just like uh, filter paper discs that have been uh, saturated with a molecule that you think might be a potential antibiotic. Those are placed on this agar plate after you've spread bacteria across the surface of the agar so that the bacteria is going to grow in that agar. After incubating it for a period of time, if there was something that was placed in that disc that is uh, inhibiting the growth of the bacteria, you will see formed what's known as a zone of inhibition. So here's a disc that contains some kind of uh, antibacterial substance. And right around it, there's a clear area where the bacteria, which is shown growing all across the rest of the plate, is not growing. And that area is measured, we call it a zone of inhibition, and the size of it will be correlated to the potency uh, and the concentration of the antibacterial molecule in that disc. So that's, that's the way we look even today some, uh, when you get a bacterial infection. Uh, in some labs, they may do this kind of assay to figure out which antibiotic, because we'll look at a whole bunch of different antibiotics in these discs and see which one is the most powerful in inhibiting uh, with a large zone of inhibition. Well, that uh, assay can be also used in the discovery of antibacterial agents. So here I just show you an actual uh, Petri dish that has that same agar that has been uh, coated with bacteria that are growing. And now these discs aren't uh, known antibiotics so that we're not looking for things to treat this particular bacterial infection that are known drugs. Instead, what people can do is they can take uh, molecules from all sorts of sources. We, they could be from synthesis, but in the old days, it was from natural product isolation. They, uh, they ferment up a large batch of some uh, mold uh, that had the potential, well, it's making all sorts of different molecules, and they'd spot a little bit of that broth from that fermentation on, a, on a, one of these discs, put it on a plate, and this might be from all sorts of different other broths and other different fermentations. And they look for the zone of inhibition. Again, this broth had nothing in it, but this one looks like there's something in that broth that's, that's inhibiting the growth because there's a large zone of inhibition. Once that's happened, then you go through an isolation process. We call this now perhaps bioassay guided fractionation, where you take a complex mixture of chemicals in a fermentation broth and now fractionate it by all sorts of different chromatographic uh, and purification techniques into multiple fractions. Now, each one of these discs could represent a different fraction of the fractionated sample from this original sample that showed activity. And now you end up ultimately, if, if, if things work well, identifying a single fraction, a single molecule that is real potent in inhibiting bacterial growth. 
Well, that uh, is not quite the process that ended up with penicillin, but it's a way that we do a lot of drug discovery in the antibiotic activity for many, many years. And from that initial discovery, Fleming and his coworkers, uh, some controversy about who actually made the discovery, they had this uh, uh, mold that I showed you on the front, on the first picture, this penicillium notatum, which had contaminated an agar plate that they were growing bacteria on. And they saw this clear area around it. And that was the first clue that there's something that that mold was producing that was an antibiotic. And then future work ended up uh, uh, growing up large amounts of that back, uh, mold, uh, isolating various fractions and identifying uh, at least a whole number of molecules, but I'm just showing you some of them that were identified from the fermentation broth, penicillin G and penicillin V. These are natural products. This, the, back then, they were given this, this stuff to people without knowing what the structure was. You, we think that's kind of incredible today, but the, the state of the art in terms of structure determination was such that people didn't know what the structure was, but they knew that the stuff was really potent and that they could get it in a fairly clean state, even if they didn't know what the structure was. Uh, and that was given to the initial patients. Eventually, the structures were determined and these are the structures. What I want to point out here is a theme that will come up a couple of other times in this seminar. When people knew the structure uh, and they knew uh, the enzyme that the, this uh, molecule was inhibiting, a critical enzyme known as a transpeptidase uh, or penicillin binding protein uh, that was critical for bacterial growth. Uh, it was like nature already had done what high powered synthetic chemists would hope to do today, a structure-based discovery. So what happened was this molecule, I don't know it's here, but it mimicked very closely two amino acids that were at the tail end of a peptide that the bacteria is going to use to cross-link to make a cell membrane. And those two amino acids were D-alanine, D-alanine. And turns out embedded in this penicillin structure were, were parts that look very much like the D-alanine, D-alanine sequence. That would bring this molecule into the active site of, of the transpeptidase. And the key here was you all probably know the four member rings are pretty strained and as a result are pretty reactive, especially if it's a lactam. And so this molecule nestled in as a key into the active site of the transpeptidase. And then the transpeptidase had a, a active site OH, serine hydroxyl, which was important in the mechanism of action of that transpeptidase, but it was uh, caught up by this penicillin that has a re reactive lactam residue it made a bond to that, opened it up, and now the enzyme was bound to the penicillin, no longer able to do its work on the transpeptidase. And that's ultimately how it worked. Nobody knew about that at the time of the discovery, but based on that, and based on what I will subsequently talk about, where people do know the mechanisms, you can start thinking about how to design molecules specifically based on those mechanistic principles. The other a point I wanna make in the discussion of penicillin is that after people did finally understand the structures of penicillin, like penicillin G and penicillin V, and understood that the lactam ring was critical for the biological activity, they could either isolate from the fermentation broth the unsubstituted, unisolated amine of the core of penicillin, and then, or they could take these molecules and chemically or enzymatically deacylate them. This became now a valuable starting material in the synthesis of all sorts of semi-synthetic uh, analogs of penicillin G and penicillin V. I just show you a few examples here. Uh, this is ampicillin, just has a different acyl group, but the same core structure. Amoxicillin, a different acyl group, same core structure. And these are now sem semi-synthetic analogs that are very valuable drugs. And this will be now a common practice that you'll see in a number of other examples here, where you start out with a key lead compound the, the first prototypical compound of a class for a particular uh, uh, disease, in this case, beta-lactams. And then people will start uh, using that understanding to make all sorts of sim uh, analogs, often by semi-synthesis or total synthesis. So I'm gonna move on to another uh, short story 
involved in a natural product origin, but also semi-synthesis and total synthesis. Uh, high cholesterol levels are obviously a problem for a number of people. Unfortunately, that's not my issue right now, but uh, I know friends who have high cholesterol levels. And um, it's important to treat these because it can lead to blood clots clogging up of the arteries and heart attacks and strokes and nasty things like that. Well, some Japanese researchers understood something of the uh, metabolic pathway for creating cholesterol. And uh, the key parts of it that I'll just talk about here is there's a molecule called acetyl-CoA that's metabolically converted to 3-hydroxy-3-methylglutaryl coenzyme A, HMG-CoA. That molecule is a key intermediate in the synthesis of cholesterol. It has to be converted into mevalonate, and mevalonate subsequently is converted into cholesterol. It has to have this conversion by an enzyme called HMG-CoA reductase. Well, that sort of makes sense. From It's gonna reduce this enzyme. I'll show you how that works in a minute. So um, Endo and his workers uh, came up with a, a simple uh, screen to look at the uh, metabolic pathway for that conversion and look for molecules that inhibited that HMG-CoA. And then they, they, with that screen in place, they looked at, again, a whole bunch of molds that were producing all sorts of different molecules and just did blind screening to look at these things to see if they could inhibit anything in the crude fermentation broth would inhibit uh, the enzyme and then do a, a, a fractionation process to identify what that active molecule was. Well, from that process, Endo and his coworkers back in uh, the mid seventies came up with a molecule known as, uh, as mev mevastatin or compactin. This molecule was the, the, the real guide and key into the, all the classes of statin molecules that we know about that are used to treat high cholesterol levels. But since we're chemists here, it's, it's valuable to look at this structurally and see how it works and, and understand how we can design new molecules based on that understanding. So here's what mevastatin looks like. So let's look at back at the, uh, that enzymatic conversion of acetyl-CoA all the way down the line through this intermediate here to cholesterol. The key step that we were going to try to inhibit is HMG-CoA reductase. That reduces this carbonyl ultimately to an alcohol. And if I show you the individual steps involved in this, then it becomes very interesting when you look at the structure of uh, compacted. This uh, reductase, it does a two-step reduction. First, it reduces that, uh, that carbonyl to an alcohol. That alcohol then eliminates the thio group on uh, uh, CoA, thio-CoA, and uh, generates uh, an aldehyde. Now, the same enzyme does a second reduction to reduce it down to an alcohol. Well, why is this very interesting? If we look at that intermediate, and this wasn't recognized in, before uh, coming up with compactin. Compactin, again, nature, just like in the, the penicillin, had done a wonderful job through trial and error over many millennia uh, uh, cycles of evolution of identifying a structure that mimicked a key intermediate in the, the uh, uh, conversion of acetyl-CoA in the cholesterol. So compactin uh, uh, biologically is not active as the lactone, it's actually converted into the open. So you cleave this lactone bond to make a hydroxy acid. And that's the active form of compactin. And that's the active form of all the statins that we'll, we'll see uh, developed in the future. But if you now look at this open structure, you can see it's an exact mimic of the structure minus uh, a methyl group here uh, of the key intermediate. And it's by virtue of that mimicking that transition from the uh, intermediate alcohol to the carbonyl that this molecule slips into the active site of HMG-CoA reductase and gets in the way of that conversion of that alcohol into the aldehyde. So that, that's the beginning point. That understanding now became a starting point for all sorts of new molecules that to inhibit cholesterol formation. So here's that first generation molecule, compactin. It actually never became a drug. There are some toxicity issues associated with it. But microbial hydroxylation 
simply converting that molecule into this hydroxyl derivative and then opening up the lactone to the active mimic of that transition state in the conversion of, of uh, acetyl-CoA all the way to, to uh, cholesterol resulted in a drug, pravastatin pravacol. Uh, that you will see now repeated often. Here's another example of a statin drug, again, with that key, preserving that key moiety, the lactone, which we know can be converted in vivo into the, uh, into the open chain lactone, which is the mimic here. Uh, this is lovastatin. Look how close lovastatin is to all these structures here. It's got the same side chain as the mevastatin, and, uh, but instead of a hydroxyl here, it's got a methyl group. That became the drug Mevacor of lovastatin. Then let's talk about semi-synthesis. Just like in the penicillins, you can take the actual natural product, chop off part of it, in this case, that acyl group, acyl group to get to this alcohol. Now that alcohol can be a starting material and they re-esterified it with a very simple modification. Now, instead of a hydrogen here, they have a methyl group. This acylated hydroxyl derivative now is known as simvastin or zocor and a very uh, important treatment for high cholesterol levels. So these were the first generation uh, inhibitors. Here I show them again, but that led to a whole series of second generation ones that now are totally synthetic. And you can see that even though they're totally synthetic, the inspirations were that open form of the lactone that binds to the key intermediate and cholesterol synthesis. And uh, Lipitor is probably one of the most highly prescribed statin inhibitors. And they went whole out with modifying major modifications on the bottom portion. But this uh, led to uh, molecules with different uh, pharmacological properties outside of just inhibiting the enzyme, which became important for that to be a really valuable drug. So the point I wanna make here, uh, in addition to the natural product origin, in addition to the semi-synthetic, uh, uh, ability to convert uh, the natural product and other derivatives, and then to use the understanding of the enzymatic mechanism of action to build new molecules. In addition to that, I just want to point out that the first molecule back in, uh, say, Mevacor, back in 87, was not the end of the story. We, we in the business, in the pharmaceutical business, would call a lot of these Me Too drugs because they were um, took off uh, took off by example from the initial discovery. Uh, and sometimes people look at Me Too drugs as, uh, well, that's just an opportunity for the pharmaceutical companies to get around the patent. And sometimes actually that's true. Uh, but other times it's because there are other properties besides the basic mechanism of action, such as this interaction here, that will uh, uh, make the drug a better drug based on all those other things I talked about, admin absorption, distribution, metabolism, excre excretion, toxicology that go beyond those important factors in the initial interaction with an enzyme. Oh, one last thing here. The molecular weight of Lipitor is 558. I'll mention this, uh, Professor Grigorenko, because you, you and I both appreciate how in the, the business, people try to come up with rules to dictate what molecules you make in advance when we're screening large virtual libraries. And there are these Lipinski rules, among them being stay away from any molecules that are, uh, are heavier, uh, have a molecular weight above 500. So I just point this one out. Just uh, ironically, uh, uh, Lipinski was working at Pfizer. And one of Pfizer's big products violates Lipinski rules. He would chuckle at that. I mean, he, he understands there's, there's, uh, these aren't rigid rules. But sometimes ma people make rules too rigid and you then avoid discoveries when your rules are too rigid. Okay, so let me now talk about another uh, interesting uh, series of drugs called angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors. These are molecules that are going to be used to treat hypertension. And I'll, I'll show you just a little bit of the hypertensive network. Obviously we have to keep our blood pressure up. And so there's uh, an endogenous uh, homeostatic balanced uh, uh, metabolic pathway uh, that involves a large protein called angiotensinogen being cleaved by a protease called renin. Renin is released by the, the kidneys. This is all happening normally in our bodies. Renin as a protease 
chops off at this between this leucine and valine a 10 amino acid decapeptide called angiotensin 1. So here it is chopped off at this bond, 10 amino acid uh, angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1 in, its, in itself, to my understanding, doesn't have a lot of uh, interesting biological properties until it is converted by an enzyme called angiotensin converting enzyme that's a dipeptidase. A dipeptidase is an enzyme that cleaves off two amino acids, the dipeptide from, uh, in this case, uh, uh, carboxydipeptides from the terminal uh, region of a peptide. And so angiotensin converting enzyme is uh, uh, a, a carboxydipeptidase. It chops off histidine and leucine. Once that happens, the new molecule created, angiotensin II, eight amino acid long, happens to have very pronounced biological properties. So until angiotensin one is converted into angiotensin two, it's not doing very much. But once it's uh, in the form of angiotensin two, it has a number of different pharmacological properties. Uh, one of the most important being uh, it's a vasoconstrictor, causes our blood vessels to constrict. When that happens, the, it causes the blood pressure to increase because of the, the, the reduced volume area that the blood can be pushed through, the blood pressure goes up. Uh, so there are, uh, there, are all, there are also receptors for this that, that cause that vasoconstriction. So if we were thinking about designing a drug based on this understanding, we could try to design a drug that inhibited the protease here, the renin, so we didn't produce any agent, angiotensin 1, so we wouldn't get angiotensin 2, and we wouldn't have its effects. Or we could make a molecule that inhibits angiotensin converting enzyme. So even though renins produce this, it's shutting down the conversion into angiotensin II. And that way we prevent the vasoconstriction increase in blood pressure. Or we could design a molecule that mimicked angiotensin II enough that it would interact with the receptor that causes vasoconstriction and block it without causing the con contraction. And that would be called an antagonist. So we could come up with an antagonist for angiotensin II. What I'm gonna talk about uh, this afternoon is angiotensin converting enzyme and inhibitors that have shown that this is a powerful way to uh, treat high blood pressure. Again, just remind you, this is part of a normal system going on. So we're, we should be making this molecule all the time. It's just when we have too much renin, we have too much production of, of uh, angiotensin II uh, for various reasons that we have uh, a debilitating increase in blood pressure. So, Again, we need to talk about screens, assays, to be able to start looking at the potential drugs that we're going to discover to inhibit uh, uh, the conversion of angiotensin 1 and angiotensin 2. In this case, it was a beautiful series of schemes that were kind of uh, nested to give you the ability to look at molecular interactions at a very uh, low complexity because we're just looking at the enzyme now, isolated. So you can isolate the converting enzyme, uh, have substrates that are processed by the converting enzyme, look at the inhibition of those uh, conversions and test your molecules there. You can look at a more complex system that now starts taking into account more than just interactions at an enzyme or a receptor, but looks at things that may have implications for ADMET, for absorption, distribution, metabolism, excretion. In this case, it's a somewhat more complex you can take a, a, a guinea pig ileum strip. This is from, well, from the ileum, ileum of a guinea pig. Uh, and suspend it between two uh, 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 levers and put it in a bath that contains important uh, biological material to keep the, the, uh, the ileum functioning. Then you can add to that bath angiotensin one. The ileum strip has in it receptors for angiotensin two that will cause the, the uh, strip to contract if angiotensin II is present. So what you do is you just have this guinea pig ileum strip in this bath. People will add the drug, the test drug, then they'll add angiotensin I. If uh, the uh, enzyme, ACE, uh, angiotensin converting enzyme, which is present in that strip, converts angiotensin I into angiotensin II, the strip will contract and uh, will you recognize that you have a potential inhibitor? Uh, I'm sorry, if, if, if the molecule that's in that bath inhibits that process, when you add angiotensin one, it won't be converted into angiotensin two, 
so the contraction won't take place. You can verify that the whole system's working well by just putting an angiotensin one without any other uh, inhibitor and immediately the guinea pig ileum strip uh, contracts. The most complex level will be at the whole animal. We can test compounds that block pleb pressure increase by first injecting the animal with angiotensin one, their blood pressure will go up. Now, if we go back and we pretreat them with a, a converting enzyme inhibitor and we inject the angiotensin one, if it's working in that whole animal, their blood pressure should not go up. Here's a really interesting source of drugs, uh, snakes. Um, when I worked at Rockefeller, I worked with snakes. So we, uh, I didn't actually work with them physically, we, but we get a, from the Miami Serpentarium serum from various snakes. And we use that as a, a very good starting point for a number of different things. I was working on trying to find molecules that affected the, uh, the uh, receptor for acetylcholine. And so snakes were a great source of a tracking molecule because they had a venom that would bind to the receptor for um, the uh, neurotransmission promoted by acetylcholine anyway. That just to point out that snakes are a rich source of, of, of natural products. This snake, among other things, paralyzes its prey, but it causes its prey's blood pressure to plummet. And uh, researchers went back and isolated a number of peptides from that snake. And uh, they were sh shown to cause the blood pressure to drop by inhibiting the conversion of angiotensin one to angiotensin two. Uh, and later on, uh, Squibb isolated some more peptides. And I'll just show you structures of those peptides. So now we're getting into the natural product area, but we're also getting into more traditional biological molecules. Um, I, I believe in peptides, I believe in proteins. Uh, as an organic chemist, I didn't always feel that way. They were like, uh, they were like polymers or something. But anyway, here's uh, the, uh, the structure of one of the peptides that inhibits uh, the conversion of a, a, uh, angiotensin 1 and angiotensin 2, and then another one, one a nonopeptide, one a penopeptide. Uh, these actually you know, could have been drugs, except that they had to be injected. And uh, you're not going to want most people with uh, hypertension to have to inject daily uh, something like this to control their, their high blood pressure. We will have see cases where people are perfectly happy to inject things when that's the only thing available. But so there was a big push to see if we could use these, this understanding of, of peptides that inhibited conversion of ACE1 of uh, angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2 to come up with a, uh, an orally active drug. Let me ask you to just remember this one simple portion of this penopeptide. That's a proline residue, the one uh, amino acid that's actually a secondary amino acid, a uh, secondary amine and it's coupled to alanine with a methyl group off the alpha position, because that will be important part of the discovery of the orally active converting N enzyme inhibitors. So folks at Squibb, who were the ones who came up with the first ACE inhibitors, uh, knew something about the action of a, an enzyme called carboxypeptidase A. Carboxypeptidase A is, as implied by the name carboxypeptidase, it's uh, a, a, an enzyme which cleaves at the carboxyl terminus of a peptide, one amino acid. And this particular enzyme is a zinc containing enzyme. So they knew it was a zinc containing enzyme. They knew it cleaved one amino acid from peptides, especially ones that had at an R1 position, this is the terminal amino acid that's gonna be cleaved here, that had either an aliphatic or an aromatic amino acid side chain. They also, uh, we're familiar with a cationic binding site, guanidine, that uh, from, uh, from not guanidine, but this, this group here, uh, that would bind to the carboxyl, three carboxylic acid um, residue in the terminal carboxylic acid of the, the peptide that's going to be cleaved. That led the people who initially came up with a, an interesting inhibitor of that enzyme, carboxypeptidase, to make small molecules that mimicked part of this structure. So they preserved the carboxyl residue. They stuck on an aromatic group here because that was what was important in carboxypeptidase A, R1 binding. And they put a carboxyl here to bind to the zinc residue. From that, they created this structure, which turned out to be a pretty decent inhibitor 
of carboxypeptidase A? Well, the researchers at Squibb, understanding that angiotensin converting enzyme was closely related to carboxypeptidase in the fact that it, it was also a zinc containing enzyme at the active site. And instead of cleaving one amino acid, the terminal amino acid, it can cleave two amino acids, the dipeptide peptidase, dipeptidase here. So cleave two amino acids. So they hypothesized that there's, there's a lot of similarity between carboxypeptidase A and carboxydipeptidase converting enzyme, except that you just extended the distance a bit so that now it, it chopped at the uh, two amino acids off. And now you had an additional binding site for the second amino acid, also had an R1 binding site for the first amino acid, but ha also had this cationic site for binding the carboxyl and would have a zinc binding site to activate the carbonyl. Based on that understanding, they came up with uh, preserving this, something that looks a lot like that R benzyl succinic acid, except they understood that that R1 group here in that first site might very well be a proline residue. They looked at a lot of other amino acids, by the way, here, but it confirmed that the proline that was present back in the uh, peptide that in the ven venom that was terminated in an alanine and proline, that that proline was predictive in the, in the uh, peptide venom of the proline that would be a good structure in their succinyl proline now they extend out the carboxyl past the point that it would have been in, the, in the, for the carboxypeptidase because they got to stretch further to find that zinc. That became their lead compound. So here it is based on that simple kind of schematic. Of course, now we would try as much as possible to get an X-ray structure of the converting enzyme to guide that kind of an understanding of what pockets you have to fill and how far you need to go to fish out a zinc. But this then became their starting point. Uh, and then they made some modifications that made sense, especially if you think back again, remember I, I told you the proline residue the, uh, was substituted in the snake venom right next to it with an alanine. So it would have had a nitrogen here and continued on the peptide. Well, it turned out that if you put a methyl group there, you increase the activity from 540 to 48, the lower the number, the better because these are IC50s, these are the concentrations at which you get 50% inhibition of the enzyme activity. So the lower the concentration you need to get that uh, inhibition, the better off you are. So we go from 540 to 48, just by putting in that methyl group as a critical indication of how stereospecific this interaction was. They put in the methyl group, but with the opposite stereochemistry and look at how the activity fell off. Uh, major, that's what, uh, maybe 20 fold or more difference just by having the, the, the right stereochemistry here. Then to finish things off, they said, okay, the carboxyl's binding to the zinc uh, ion in the active site. Maybe if we replace it with a thiol group, which will bind much tighter to a carboxyl group, we can increase the activity against the enzyme. And that turned out to be true for the simplest molecule here unsubstituted with a methyl. That was a major, major discovery, going from 540 down to a very low concentration to inhibit uh, the enzyme. Then the final steps were to put back in the methyl group. Again, the methyl group in the wrong orientation didn't do a lot for you. It, it, it uh, did actually, well, no, it wasn't, it, was, it wasn't even as good as that molecule. But if you had the methyl group in the right configuration, you went from 0.16 to 0.02. So again, a major, increase in the biological activity. That became the first drug, the first of the class of angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors known as captopril or capitin. Now to go through this theme of, uh, we'll, we'll say me too, but not really in a pejorative sense because it really does lead, lead to molecules which are, are more valuable than the initial molecule. Here's captopril discovered in 1980, well, uh, became a drug in 1981. Here's a drug that has greatly replaced, not this molecule, but a close analog of it, has replaced captopril. I say a close analog. This molecule is a really potent inhibitor of converting enzyme, uh, much more potent than captopril. It was shown to be quite active by injection. But again, you're not going to, it's almost like the snake venom. You're not going to want to inject this. And so they did a very simple 
uh, conversion here. All that Merck did, who discovered uh, uh, enalaprilat, when they recognized that it wasn't going to be an orally active drug, all they did was put on an ethyl, uh, made an ethyl ester of the carboxylic acid. And this molecule now meets one of those ADMET criteria that I say makes a difference well beyond just being active at the enzyme or the receptor. This molecule now can be absorbed from the stomach into the bloodstream. Which is, once it's in the bloodstream, it is converted rapidly back to enalaprilat, which is the active molecule. So this is in fact what we call a prodrug. And that this kind of makes it a little bit more difficult to do your prediction uh, from virtual libraries of what molecule is going to be the ultimate drug, because this molecule is, uh, wouldn't be predicted to be the ultimate drug if you're just looking at its ability to inhibit the enzyme. We know you need a free carboxyl here. So just want to point that out. This is a, another indication we need to be open-minded when we think about how we process what molecules we're going to make. So that's, I'll call these first generation. But you'll see again, people recognize the core structure here. They went back to the carboxyl, by the way, rather than the thiol. There were some issues uh, with thiol uh, containing molecules that I think um, made it less attractive than the carboxyl derivatives. And then they found another binding site within the enzyme beyond the alpha position uh, of a, a, a homophenylalanine and lysine group here. But you see in lisinopril, the same structure as in nalprat, same basic structure as in uh, captopril, and then prodrug derivatives, ramapril and benazapril but again, pre preserving a lot of the structures that you've seen in earlier converting enzyme inhibitors, but presumably, hopefully not just patent busting molecules that earn the pharmaceutical company more money, but have value in themselves as drugs. And I don't know enough about the details of these molecules and their side effects, but they are being prescribed. So there must be something that gives them an advantage besides um, just price. The final uh, series I'm going to start uh, talk about today are when we get into uh, peptides and proteins. So this is going to be a story on insulin and uh, its evolution from pig insulin to human insulin to derivatives of human insulin. Here is a structure of insulin. Uh, insulin is now known when it was first discovered, obviously they didn't know the structure, but it's uh, a peptide. Uh, a dimeric peptide. It's got two peptide chains, the beta chain and the alpha chain, that are linked together by disulfide bonds. This is the structure, and it's just simple amino acids, you know, strung together like beads to give us the active human insulin. Well, when insulin was first discovered and shown to be a valuable molecule to treat diabetes, insulin is important uh, for our uh, our bodies because when we take in a, a large uh, batch of glucose, we have to realize that it, 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 in and of itself, it's not going to be immediately used and, and too much of that glucose will be uh, create uh, not good uh, side effects in humans. So the glucose is stored in glycogen and insulin uh, is the signal that tells the body to convert uh, the free, free floating glucose in our blood back into glycogen for storage until when it's needed again for uh, the activities that glu glucose will uh, promote in our body. Uh, it was discovered though, many years ago, uh, I guess it was probably in the, uh, was it in the twenties? Yes, uh, by Ban and uh, Banning and Best in Canada, where they uh, uh, closed off um, some tubes coming from the pancreas shutting down the release of insulin and producing a diabetic state in uh, dogs. And they were able ultimately to isolate what the pancreas was uh, secreting that had prevented the diabetes from occurring, which helped regulate the glucose levels. And that molecule was called insulin. Again, back in the beginning, they didn't know what the structure was, but they were able to isolate this substance, uh, which would promote uh, conversion of glucose into glycogen and prevent the, the diabetic uh, effects of, of ligating that, the tubes from pancreases and in dogs. 
that in not too uh, short a period, of, not too long a period of time, led to a commercial production of insulin to uh, treat diabetes. Um, I speak to that from my experience at Lilly, but there are a number of other companies involved in this. But insulin, that yeah, Lilly did a lot of the pioneering work in the production of insulin, but it wasn't human insulin. You're not going to go about getting human insulin for people <laughs> so, uh, to treat diabetes. So instead, they have gone to uh, two major sources for, of insulin. One was pigs, the other was cows. And this is just a sh shows you the structure of uh, cow insulin. And it's very close in structure to human insulin. The only difference is an alanine and a valine at positions eight and 10, rather than the threonine and isoleucine in human insulin. And then at the very end, instead of an alanine, there is a threonine. So very close in structure, so close in structure that it worked almost as well as our, we'll find out human insulin works in, in people. And so that was became a rich source of, of insulin uh, for treating people with diabetes. You get big box loads, big box car loads of pig pancreases and cow pancreases coming in, in these box cars to Lilly uh, in a building that I, I used to work next to. And they grind up the pancreas, a quite smelly process, and uh, then ultimately uh, uh, purify the insulin, insulin, either pig or, or bovine insulin, and, and put it in bottles and use it to treat people, revolutionize the treatment of diabetes. But it wasn't human insulin. So the next stage of the story was when people realized uh, that human insulin, uh, yes, it's difficult to get from people, but we're gonna have to find the source of insulin outside of pigs and cows because the number of diabetics is greatly increasing at a rate that wasn't corresponding to the increased availability of pig and cow pancreases. So there was an effort made as recombinant uh, technology became available to figure out a way to make human insulin uh, outside of isolating it from us uh, and then put it in a bottle. And so recombinant technology developed uh, production-wise at, at Genentech, eventually taken over, I mean, uh, Lilly adapted these processes, was able, we were able to make human insulin and that's largely replaced any source of insulin uh, like pigs and cows. Uh, but that also led to the potential to do drug SAR on a protein or in this case on a peptide. So here we finally get to the point where we have human insulin available on a production basis using re recombinant technology. So you can play with the, the genes that code for, for human insulin and make switches in the amino acids wherever you want to and see what you could do. So it's an SAR really. One of the researchers at Lilly named Richard DeMarkey and some of his colleagues recognized that uh, one of the problems with human insulin is when you inject it, it, is, it aggregates. It's in an aggregated form. I believe it's a hexamer or pentamer hexamer. And this aggregated form only slowly will disaggregate to allow the human insulin to migrate into the blood and to the places that it needs to be to regulate the conversion of glucose into glycogen. So if you're a diabetic, and you've just taken a, a bunch of a high glucose meal and you want to regulate the, uh, keep yourself from going into a coma because you've got so much glucose going around that's not being processed. You can't just inject insulin and expect it to work right away because it's gonna sit in a glob and take a while to associate it into the, the monomeric and dimeric forms that are gonna migrate and, and have the biological effect. Well, these researchers, uh, recognize, and I, I should get the story from them someday, how insightful it was that they made the decision to swap the positions, sw simply exchange the positions of the lysine and the proline in human insulin to get the lysine in position 28 and the proline in position 29, and that's called lyse pro. Well, that simple act greatly changed the uh, chemical properties of this uh, humalog called insulin in terms of its ability to aggregate. It dissociates into the, the active monomeric form much more rapidly. So it's much more rapid acting. So you now have the ability 
uh, if you so choose, to regulate uh, your insulin level much more quickly if you are anticipating a meal with a high amount of glucose, you give yourself an injection right before and you're ready to start processing that glucose. Uh, so this has led to a whole area of what well, we'll call me too's, but there's a whole world of in, uh, insulin analogs out there made by recombinant metho methodologies that give you improved uh, pharmacodynamics, improved admin met properties over parent human insulin and have been valuable in treating diabetes. The final protein that I'll talk about today is antibody. So we've now gone from 300 molecular weight to 150,000 molecular weight. Still, these are drugs. And we know that very well as we talk about getting a vaccine vaccinated with the SARS spike protein in order to cause our bodies to, mo to, to make a lot of antibodies to the spike protein and help us uh, and not get uh, uh, the COVID-19 infection. Uh, Perceptin is another really important antibody, one of the original antibodies to uh, be used in a therapeutic fashion to treat breast cancer. Uh, and what is interesting is we come back at the end of this lecture to this lock and key concept is that if we think of uh, the lock being the antigen, the, the antigen is the what we call the structure that is on the uh, foreign substance that you want to interact with the block. And so this is, it, it's usually a, a protein of some sort or, or modified protein or modified peptide. That antigen uh, is gonna to bind to the antibody. These complex structures have super variable amino acid sequences in, in two of their arms. These are replicated arms on both sides. But if we just look at this one antigen binding site, the summation of these two sites results in the key, uh, the, the notches on the key that are gonna be able to recognize a particular antigen. And it's by virtue of the antibody's powerful mechanism in our body, our body's powerful mechanism to make millions of different antibodies, trying out all sorts of different keys here to find the one right key to lock to this an antigen that we are able to survive, basically. So let me just finish up by showing you a little schematic of how this might happen. So here we have uh, just a, a three amino acid sequence embedded in this hypervariable region on either the a heavy chain or the light chain. You can think of all the combinatorial different possibilities to just three amino acids uh, that you could have there. So in instead of a asparagine, a glycine, and a leucine, you could have a, a glutamine, an alanine, or a lysine. So that's just three amino acids that have been swapped out. But since we have 20 amino acids possible here, 20 amino acids possible here, 20 amino acids possible here, that gives you 8,000 different possibilities for just a simple tripeptide sequence. So 8,000 different possible keys, basically, to try out on this lock, that, that antigen. And that's what the body does quite effectively. So just to take us back to the schematics here, here's our key, here's our lock. Here's the hypervariable region within the antibody with a, I'm just showing three amino acid sequence, but there are actually many more amino acids in the hypervariable region that can be varied by our body, by the B cells that make these antibodies. So here we have it, there's amino acid uh, R1 with its side chain, R2 with its side chain, and the body makes a million of these things, trying out all these different combinations. It finds one, in this case, schematically, with a glutamine residue that has just the right distance to fill that pocket and, and the right hydrogen bonding capabilities, an alanine with a methyl residue that hops into a, perhaps a hydrophobic pocket, and maybe now a cationic pocket to bind a lysine. And that now becomes the, the antibody of choice. Body scales it up, gets that B cell to, to make many of it. And again, we have just from a three amino acid sequence, 8,000 different possibilities. But uh, since we have many more uh, amino acids that can be varied, the body may, can make millions of antibodies. And this will be the seed for talking about combinatorial chemistry um, and the power, the potential power to try to re replicate what the body does by making millions of different molecules, testing them, finding what's active. So I'll come back to Paxlovid and where we might be going from there. 
So here again is the active ingredient near Mitrelvir. If we open up that box, we'll see that in fact, there are three pills and in, 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 in the doses given either in the morning or in the afternoon. This is the evening doses. And there are two, it's just two of those pills that are near Mitrelvir. So what's this third pill? They, Paxlovid is two different drugs in one. So it's got the pills for near Mitrelvir. It's gonna inhibit that enzyme, key enzyme and replication for the virus. But in addition, they have included a pill that contains ritinavir. Ritinavir is, you, uh, inhibits the metabolism of neuromitrelvir. Ironically, it's also a, a pre protease inhibitor. It's used to treat AIDS. But in this case, it inhibits the metabolism of neuromitrelvir. So even though neuromitrelvir is really great in terms of inhibiting the enzyme, it still is problematic in terms of other properties, such as its longevity in the body due to the fact that it's metabolized. So ritinavir is in included to pr preserve that activity. So if I come back to this big scheme again of the disease, we talk a lot about receptor-based, enzyme-based, tissue-based screens to develop our hits. But always remember, there are a lot of other factors that go into making it a drug, which inv involve the absorption, the admet properties. And these are things that sometimes are difficult to uh, manage at the same time you're, you're managing the inherent ability to inhibit an enzyme or receptor because you mess with one of the uh, things that helps uh, increase absorption and all of a sudden you decrease the ability to inhibit the enzyme. So here we are. This is the first generation MPRO inhibitor to treat COVID-19 near Mitrelvir. I'm saying we're gonna see many second generation MPRO inhibitors to treat that, that disease COVID-19. And they're not gonna just be me too in the sense that they're, they're patent busting and they give somebody, some other company uh, the ability to make money off inhibition. No, there are gonna be other molecules there that have unique properties that make it valuable in addition to near Mitrelvir. Maybe they won't be metabolized as rapidly. We can expect just like with bacteria that COVID-19 eventually is gonna figure out a way to mutate the mPro enzyme so that near Mitrelvir is no longer as active. Well, we're gonna to wanna to have inhibitors that can now meet the demand of the mutated uh, mPro, the mutated enzyme and inhibit it. So with that, I'll, I'll end this uh, seminar and just tell you that um, I hope you have, if you're interested, you'll listen to November 8th, I'll talk about CombiChem and solid phase synthesis, where we are, where that whole area has come. Um, in particular, uh, the value of the virtual libraries that can be made uh, based on uh, combinatorial chemistry and how we can use those virtual libraries to make real compounds with some better uh, thoughtfulness than was done in the early days of CombiChem. Uh, and then finally, on the 15th, I'll talk about it, the distributed drug discovery program, which I hope you know sometime I can in person come to Kiev and, and be part of a laboratory where students would be involved in making potential drug molecules. We use this project to both educate global students in synthesis and biology, but also to have a, a vast international network of students who are simultaneously learning these skills, but also applying them to trying to discover important treatments. In the case of D3, we'll be looking at Pseudomonas rugosa and COVID-19. So uh, thank you very much. Is it uh, Jean Koya? Jane Koya? <laughs> But anyway, I, I enjoyed having the opportunity to present to you today. And I, I really wish you well. And I hope this will be a sign of the solidarity that we as scientists in the United States feel towards you. And we'll do everything possible to, to while the war is going on, after the war is going on, to help you keep in contact with the, the scientific world and benefit from it as we have benefited from you. I can tell you that enamine is par excellence uh, a, a great uh, example of science in operation on a production scale, on a, on a for profit scale. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Bill, for your kind words and for your excellent lecture. So, uh, are there any questions? I, I see already. Anton, please. Uh -huh. All right, I see. And Maria. Um, yeah, thank you very much for our uh, presentation. And uh, um, I have a few questions about this treatment uh, for uh, COVID-19. 
uh, so it's like um, uh, uh, it's like vaccination, like treatment uh, before the disease, or it's um, uh, you need to um, to have this medicines already when you have some symptoms. Yes, um, that's a good question. It, it's one of the first treatments for after you have the disease. There are a number of other molecules that operate by a different mechanism of action, but nirmatrelvir is effective if it's given within five days of the initial diagnosis of uh, COVID-19. Uh, past that, I don't know how well the clinical trials have shown, but if you can take uh, nirmatrelvir or Paxlovid, that combination, within five days of when you uh, tested positive for COVID-19, you greatly decrease the uh, likelihood that you end up in a hospital. Uh, thank you. And uh, uh, the second question uh, also about this, uh, we know that uh, there are uh, different, uh, I don't know, like stumps, uh, I mean, uh, uh, different uh, COVID-19 with different uh, symptoms. And uh, this medicine works for um, specific uh, uh, COVID-19 or it's like in general. Yeah, so I, I think, let me make sure I understand your question. Um, is it with regard to whether or not that mechanism might apply to other viruses? I believe uh, Maria was asking about uh, different various, various variants of COVID-19. Does it work for all of them or, or for yes. some of them? Okay, thank, thank you. Yes, uh, as far as we know now, it works for all of them. But uh, I know there's been one published report where in the laboratory, they've looked at uh, evolution of, of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, and they've detected some variants on the CoV-2 virus. This is in a laboratory that had mutations in that, that main protease that suggests that it may become a problem in the future. But as far as I know now, there's no indication that there's resistance to nirmatrelvir in Paxlovid in the current uh, variety of, of SARS-CoV-2 viruses floating around. Okay, thank you. Okay, and Metro. Thank you very much for your presentation. And um, my question is, uh, as I have understood, uh, all of these approaches, they take quite a long period of time. And uh, how do you think, what uh, other methods maybe, uh, as I can uh, uh, understood, as I have understood, you just have to do all of these experiments in lab and, uh, and so on and so on. And uh, how do you think, can we use uh, some 3D modeling or any, uh, chemical confirmation calculation things and uh, using them to uh, minimize the time we need to get the new generations and so on. Thank you. Yes, uh, that's a good question. And uh, I think the, the major issue is going to be to what extent those uh, predictive tools are going to be able to handle all the different uh, demands on what a drug needs to be in order to be a viable, what a molecule needs. So that's why I tried to make a point of distinguishing between enzyme and receptor screens that allow us to use these computer-based models, uh, certainly at, at the uh, structural level, to do a better job of designing molecules that would be active there. That's a clear advance. The problem is when we try to model all the other aspects involving absorption, distribution, metabolism, excretion, um, and then have that in addition to modeling the enzyme and receptor interactions. So I, yes, I think we can make progress certainly in designing the molecules at the um, molecular level to have the proper interaction with the ultimate target. But I think it's gonna be a while before we figure out all the other variables. There certainly are processes where people try to have models to look at what makes a molecule better absorbed or what will influence whether or not this molecule will have metabolic stability. And those will also be important and they are important computational pieces. But as you saw in one of those situations, we can still make the wrong decision. Like for example, when we have prodrugs, the prodrug is, is not gonna be a molecule that would look like it's gonna be active against the ultimate enzyme or receptor. 
yet it has favorable properties for, for absorption. Um, and so it's gonna be a while before we work all those out. But uh, yeah, there's, I believe in the modeling process for, for helping us, especially in the CombiChem area, narrow down from these huge virtual libraries and catalogs, some of our first choices. But I, I'm also cautious about uh, being too uh, discriminating and eliminating too many choices before you have a chance to test them. Uh, I think it's still going to be a long process. Thank you. Hey, Taras. Uh, so first of all, I want to uh, say yes, I want to thank to Mr. Court for this uh, lovely and uh, great presentation. Uh, so my question is uh, a little bit general, I think. Uh, what uh, biological target are the most popular in drug discovery? Oh, gee, what biological target is the most? You know, I, I would say in uh, just a very, very general term, you know, if, if it's an enzyme target, those tend to be the most popular targets. If you're talking about a target for a particular disease, is that what you were wondering about? Or are you wondering about uh, whether it's receptors or enzymes or? Um, I think, no. Um, for me, biological targets is uh, no, also enzymes, uh, uh, ion channels, uh, transport uh, uh, proteins, uh, and yeah. so on, so yeah, on. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, uh, I can't give you my best understanding of that, you know. Certainly when I talked here, I focused on enzymes and receptors, uh, but there are other, other uh, mechanisms as you, as you talk about, you know, ion channels, but uh, that, that will also involve these molecular interactions, which we could kind of talk about as being receptors. I know that uh, enzymes have the, the most uh, percent of uh... Mm, it's the most uh, percent of biological target. And uh, Alexander Grango, um, yeah, before told uh, um, us um, this information that enzymes have uh, the, the most of um, a drug discovery. Yeah, they are, they are the mo among most, but of course, receptors are very important too. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, uh, the, are there any questions additional? So I, have, I also have one question. What is your opinion about uh, this? Uh, so we are seeing a lot of biological molecules in uh, drug discovery in recent two decades or so. And uh, there are many proteins on the market, uh, antibodies, for example, and many others. How do you think uh, how it will be developed in the next decade or two? So uh, will biologic overcome small molecule drugs completely? Or will uh, the, the, the area for chemists, for us chemists, to develop new, uh, new uh, small molecules remain quite important too? Well, Professor Grigorenko, you, you pointed out to, in your review article, is you, do you call it the, the Gartner cycle? Mm -hmm. is that 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 uh, process over time by which people get very excited about a new approach to problem solving. And in the drug discovery area, we've seen a number of the examples of that. One example would be the combinatorial chemistry area where there's a lot of excitement, a lot of work put into it. It didn't bear fruit initially, uh, and a lot of interest was lost. And eventually, I think interest is coming back. In terms of proteins, Boy, that's been that, that whole area has just exploded over the last few years to the extent where I see the practical impact that has on research at a place like Lilly, where they have uh, greatly downsized the number of their synthetic organic chemists doing research at the small molecule level. Uh, but now a lot of small companies are taking taking that over. I think what's going to happen is that. Uh, it's clear that antibodies and proteins are very important, but they, they fill a, a particular niche that is never going to be filled uh, by them in, to the exclusion of small molecules. I think they will always, and so I think eventually in the coming five, 10 years, 
there's going to be a, a resurgence of interest in focusing even on natural products, small molecule natural products, um, and derivatives of them, as we, we talked about earlier. Um, and so uh, I think, uh, well, as an example, uh, uh, companies have gotten rid of, to a large extent, their, uh, their natural products discovery areas because it was too complicated for them. But they lost a lot of that ability to, to understand and take mixtures of compounds and figure out what was active in it and pursue that. So I think a lot of this expertise will come back in different ways and, and, it, will, and it will be related to small molecules. So I'm not concerned about that going away by any means. I mean, again, you know, the antibodies, you don't take an antibody in a pill and uh, you don't, it's gonna be long ways before we have uh, water soluble orally active antibodies that we take in a pill. So there'll always be a way, uh, a real importance for small molecules. Okay. Thank you again. And uh, if there are no um, questions left, then uh, I will, uh, I shall remind to those who will be watching us in recording that you can uh, put, put your questions as comments on YouTube and uh, Professor Scott will answer them on his next lectures or, I'll, or I shall uh, pass them to him uh, uh, in, for the next uh, lectures. So please uh, watch the, 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 the video when it is available on YouTube and uh, make your questions, ask your questions if you have any. And I'd like to thank uh, everybody for attending this lecture. And of course, to our guest, to, to Bill, for, uh, for joining us and for giving this opportunity for our Ukraine, for Ukrainian students and Ukrainian chemists to, uh, to have some, uh, to share some experience uh, with in drug discovery. And I'm looking forward, of course, for the next lecture and I invite everyone to join us again uh, on next Tuesday. Thank you. And I, I hope someday I'll, I'll be on that train from Lublin and I can visit you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.